Dear participants, good evening. My name is Jose Maria Figueres. I am co-chief executive officer of the World Economic Forum. And I will serve as your moderator in this opening plenary session, which has as its objective to set the broader, the larger stage for our discussions and deliberations over the next days as we work on how we can better partner to achieve security and prosperity. We want to look at security from a holistic perspective, beginning with the individual security aspects that we all want to have in our lives, all the way through the geopolitics of security, which has become so much of a part of our daily lives. And we want to look at prosperity, not only as economic growth, but going much beyond that to set the conditions in which people around the world can live with dignity. Security and prosperity in the world of today have become two sides of the same coin. And bettering conditions with respect to one of these themes is going to require a tremendous amount of action and effort on the other one as well. So partnering is the name of the game. Partnering is how we can achieve this. And President Hatami just spoke so well to the issues of partnering on this globe in order to move forward in resolving the pressing issues that may not look so complex from space, but that here on Earth certainly are a big challenge today. We have on stage a group of panelists which reflect the multi-stakeholder dimension of the communities of the World Economic Forum, and that can so adequately speak then to the issue of partnering. They need no further introduction. They, you know them well. And I would therefore begin by going immediately to Jack Straw. Now, Mr. Secretary, could you please give us some opening remarks? Uh, in which you share your view of where we are at this point in time in terms of global security. Are we really managing the global environment in a way that is conducive to have the best possible of global security, both from a country national perspective and also from an individual perspective of the people that, leaves, that live in these nations? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, can I, before doing so, express thanks on behalf of uh, all of us for uh, the address at which we've just heard by His Excellency the President of Iran. Uh, it was uh, an extraordinarily broad canvas, um, and uh, I think it says something about the, the breadth of the intellect of the uh, President of Iran that he was able to uh, weave in and out uh, of uh, this speech uh, references uh, to Max Weber uh, and uh, to Hegel uh, as easily as obviously he was informed by uh, the, uh, the philosophers in uh, Iran uh, and in the Islamic uh, tradition. Uh, and he was dead right uh, to say that uh, democracy uh, is a human experience, uh, not a Western invention. Uh, and his uh, observation that uh, democracy involves a process, um, not a revolutionary event, seems to be one of which uh, Max Weber himself uh, would have approved. Um, you've asked me some questions. Um, and allow me, to, first of all, just to put this briefly, Mr. Chairman, into some historical context, because it was a realization that security and prosperity could be built through partnership uh, that, that drove statesmen in the aftermath of the Second World War to build the international political and economic framework in the shape of the UN, the Bretton Woods institutions, and the GATT. Now, the world, as we all know, has changed a very great deal since then. And whilst world output in 2000, in the year 2000, was six times what it was in 1950, our interdependence has grown more, stickly, more quickly still, supported by those international institutions I've just mentioned. For world trade grew between 1950 and 2000 
not by that factor of six by which world output grew, but by a factor of 20. And to take another even more startling example, since the mid-1980s, when we saw not only the breakdown of the uh, fixed rate currency agreements of Bretton Woods, but also the end of uh, capital controls in most systems, foreign exchange turnover has grown from around 200 uh, US uh, dollars, 200 billion US dollars a day, to 1.6 trillion uh, US dollars a day, a factor of uh, 80. And again, President Hartami was uh, absolutely right to uh, talk about the increasing and organic connection between uh, different plus parts of our planet. Now, the world of Cold War blocks has therefore been replaced by a complex and internet interlocking network of relationships. And the threats to our security today are as likely to come from non-state actors as terrorists as from other states. And the breakdown of state authority in turn creates the conditions where these threats can thrive as the 11th of September showed so tragically. But terrorism is not the only threat we face. Chronic poverty, disease, environmental degradation, the widespread denial of justice, all typically underpinned by corruption, the lack of a decent democracy and the rule of law, are factors behind insecurity and conflict, and all are linked to each other. The world is very different from 1945, but what is striking today is that these differences in reality have not been matched by parallel changes to the post-war multilateral international framework, to come to the heart mm -hmm. of the question, Mr. <coughs> Chairman, that you put to me. But the framework itself is more important than ever because the challenges and opportunities which we face today go far beyond national borders. Now, res to respond to these challenges therefore requires the international system to become much more effective. And that means not just acting as a conduit for dialogue and mutual understanding, because sadly that is sometimes not enough against the threats which we face. Being effective also means being prepared where necessary to enforce international rules through common action, including military action as a last resort. I know that people here took, some people took different views on the military intervention in Iraq. Uh, all I ask is for those who did, whose views I respect, to consider where the world might have been had we simply walked away from the clear decisions of the United Nations taken unanimously in November of 2002 uh, to set an ultimatum uh, to Saddam Hussein uh, with the provision of a final opportunity in 1441 uh, and serious consequences if that final opportunity was not met. Now, I therefore greatly welcome the debate on the future of the international framework, including the establishment by Kofi Annan of his high-level panel on the future of the United Nations. But I just wanted to say this. Yes, the United Nations needs to be made more organizationally efficient, and yes, it may require some institutional uh, changes, al although whether we achieve that uh, nirvana of uh, reform to the Security Council, I think uh, rem remains to be seen. But there's a more important, if more difficult, challenge before us, which is whether we need to change the jurisprudence of the United Nations to take account of the different challenges and threats which we now face. Now, there has already been uh, some change in recent years, and the jurisprudence of the international community has changed, for example, in response to the profound humanitarian threat in Kosovo and the UN's retrospective uh, response to that. But Iraq also raised a, a bigger and more sensitive issue, but one we have to grasp. At what point is it appropriate for states to act either in self-defense or 
through collective international action to take preemptive or preventative uh, action against non-state actors and state actors alike. What circumstances are appropriate for Chapter 7 intervention uh, in such conditions? There's never going to be a single or perfect answer uh, to that, but through great difficulties, the United Nations founders came to a pretty clear view about the circumstances where traditional state actors might and might not be able to intervene against other traditional state actors, and everybody accepts that. But in the new circumstances, I suggest that we need a new uh, jurisprudence. But I also um, suggest that alongside doing that, we have to work out again, as President Hartmey uh, suggested, how we build up better and more reliable partners uh, around the globe. And how we recognize together that in globalization, which by some is seen as such a, a threat to local democracy and to local uh, prosperity, there is the opportunity to provide uh, that universal prosperity of which President Hartemi uh, was speaking. If you take trade liberalization, for example, the interests of business and of the world's poorest countries and poorest people are the same, re-energizing the Doha round. And the European Commission estimates that halving protectionist measures would boost world trade by 400 billion US dollars, of which 150 billion would go to developing countries. Three times, I may say, what they receive in development aid uh, from more prosperous countries. So it's a safer, more just world which offers business the best conditions for lasting success. But I also say this is not just something that, in which government has one role and business has another. Business itself has a, a real responsibility to set high standards of con conduct and of transparent conduct. And in doing so, businesses can reinforce the standards in the countries where they operate both for governments and for local businesses with which they work. And there are good examples of this on which we need to build. The United Nations Global Compact, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, launched by the United Kingdom, and the Ethical Trading Initiative, which exists in many countries, including the United Kingdom. Chairman, a strong partnership between government and business is of huge importance, therefore, in meeting the challenges of an interdependent and complex world. And I believe that I, my colleagues here on this panel have a great amount of experience and wisdom to offer on how we can make this partnership stronger. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, I would like to go then to uh, President Obasanjo, if I may. Now, Mr. President, some of the most important threats that we have in the world of today uh, with respect to security unfortunately come from diverse world views uh, that are held by some followers, followers of different faiths and traditions. So you come imbued with a very special perspective as the president of a nation that has to reconcile and address the challenge of an Islamic culture in the North and a Christian culture in the South within a single nation state. How do you feel we can better partner to achieve security in those conditions? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Madrito. You are absolutely right. I come from a country that is almost 50% Islamic and 50% Christian. But that is not just the diversity in my country. We are a country with over 300 ethnic 
groups with different languages, and not dialects, but different languages. I see Jack Straw nodding his head. I think the answer, I will, or the question I will have asked him is, how did the British colonial power hold it together? <laughs> Do you want the answer? <laughs> Mr. President, I'm sorry, could you please uh, speak a little bit more into the microphone? Yes. Thank you. But I have said this, and I will say it again, that maybe if we succeed in Nigeria in holding that country together with all its diversity, diversity in religion, diversity in language, diversity in ethnicity, even diversity in level of development. Maybe the world will have something to learn from Nigeria. Maybe we will have something that is unique to give to the world how we have made it. But the one good point, taking the religious aspect that we have raised, uh, Mr. Madrito. The one good point is that these two religions originate from the same mold. Christianity and Islam are really brother religions. I had opportunity not too long ago, when I was incarcerated, to read the Quran, the holy book of our Islamic brothers and sisters, from cover to cover, the English translation. And of course, I had wonderful opportunity to also read the Bible, the holy book of members of Christian community in our society. And I was amazed at the similarity, particularly in terms of what in the Bible is called the Old Testament. So if we go to religion, or even we go to philosophy, or even we go to the values within our society, what, if you like, you may call native values. There is really not much to choose between Christianity and Islam in a society like Nigeria. And apart from that, there is also something unique in many parts of Nigeria. We have two brothers, where one brother is a Christian, another is a Muslim. When Christian festivity comes, the Muslim brother participates with the Christian brother. When Muslim festivity comes, the Christian brother participates with the Muslim brother. The unfortunate thing at times is that when there are things to share, then the difference comes to the fore. If the thing to share, whether it's economic or political, goes to one and the other one feels that you have been excluded. That is when we take a resort into the base instinct of looking for differences or exaggerating our differences. Then you will say, yes, I didn't get this because he is a Muslim, I'm a Christian. Or yes, I didn't get this because he is a Muslim, I uh, is a Christian, I'm a Muslim. 
So what I see as the real issue is what we are talking about here today, partnership, security, and prosperity. Where there is genuine partnership, of course, it strengthens security. And I'm here not talking of security in terms, only in terms of physical protection of physical security. I'm talking of security in a more ramifying and in a more embracing manner. Security of job, security of life, security of your family, food security, security within your community. And when you have such a situation, of course, it, for, it forms the basis of prosperity. Security that is based on partnership. What I call common security. You don't look at your own security while you are not considering my own security. Mm. Or I look at your security as not as important as my security. If, of course, we have common security, it will, without doubt, lead to what I call common prosperity. And as it applies in a family, because if only one, we will have this extended family uh, system, whereby if you are well-to-do in the family, now, you, your family is regarded as well-to-do because you do not differentiate that what I have is mine. Then you, it belongs to the extended family. And that provides certain amount of stability within the family. Now, I see that extending to community and indeed to a nation that what when you care and share, which is partnership, then it strengthens the security, it strengthens the stability of that community, of that nation, and of course, it gives, it, it, it forms the basis for prosperity. Prosperity because the security and the commonality of uh, uh, sharing and, and caring makes it everybody to feel that he's his brother or sister's keeper. And in an atmosphere like that, atmo an atmosphere like that you have opportunity to work together for both in for individual family, community, and national prosperity. Thank you, Mr. So President. So I see for us a, a, a divided or seemingly divided country along the line of religion, along the line of uh, language, along the line of ethni uh, ethnicity, along the line of level of development. I see the basis for our coming together as partnership, sharing and caring, security based on that, and development based on that. A country like ours has to firm its governance on democracy, democracy and dialogue, discussion, and I see it, as I said, only common security and common prosperity. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, Sean, let me, let, let me please uh, go to you here. Uh, we're talking about partnering, and of course, development issues and advancing on security and prosperity is too important to be left in the hands of government alone. Uh, you come from a part of the world that has been very much in the 
eye of the storm with respect to these themes. And you are a social entrepreneur and you are on the ground. So from a civil society perspective, what you have heard from Secretary Straw and from President Obasanjo, does that fill your expectations in terms of a partnership? I mean, can we really have a deal here in advance on the issues uh, that we want to advance? I intend to take the bull by its horns, so let's get going. It is my belief that growing poverty and increased inequity in wealth are two of the biggest threats to world security today. Many people have talked about global uh, statistics of poverty. There are 1.2 billion people that live at a dollar a day. That alone is three times the population of Western Europe. If we look at the region of South Asia, the economies of both India and Pakistan have grown. However, at the same time, poverty statistics can, can continue to edge forward. 44% of India's 1 billion population and 31% of Pakistan's 145 million population are impoverished today. That implies one out of every two households in South Asia goes hungry today. It is people living on the edge that become the cannon fodder for reactionary radicalism the world over. If we look at the GDP of 48 of the poorest countries in the world, it is not equal, it is in fact less than the wealth of three of the richest people in the world. The above statistics fail to capture the humiliation, the powerlessness, and the hardship that is the daily lot of the poor. I don't believe it's enough to say in an interrelated world that the poor are getting poorer because, because of weak governance, or poor management of their governments. It's the increased debt burden of the developing countries that further aggravates the situation. For example, for every one dollar that is received in de development aid today, developing countries pay back $13 in debt servicing. Let's look at Pakistan. The majority of the country's debt today comprises of short-term borrowings that escalates the cost of sovereign debt for the country. I believe that is world leaders, we need to focus attention on this issue. We have to make development aid more poor friendly. If we look at global statistics further, there is a deep feminization of poverty, which means 70% of the world's poor are women today. And this further aggravates the issues of security and prosperity because 50% of the world's population cannot partake in economic gains. Societies, that discriminate on the basis of gender can neither prosper nor have safe and secure communities. Women's role in the economy is currently unrecognized. In some regions of the world, women's participation in the informal sector is as high as 70%. However, there are anomalies regarding this issue. For example, in Pakistan, research was done of the four biggest urban centers in the country, and we discovered that women's participation in the informal sector is 80%. However, the official uh, female labor participation rate is as low as 2.8%. This leads to a situ situation of gender-blind policies. Uh, women face glass ceilings in the management and business scene. I'm glad to see that Carly Fiorina is here to disprove that theory. However, women also face glass ceilings in parliaments of the world. If you look at the 180 legislatures in the world, women's participation is as low as 12.5%. I was told today that in the World Economic Forum, women's participation has increased to 15%. I hope it rises to 50% one day. <laughs> Even in Western Europe, Even in Western Europe, which is, which is where women's political participation is higher, highest, it's only at 18%. The paucity of women in legislatures hinders good governance and global progress. We need to pay attention to this issue by investing in women's economic participation because that will not only enhance the uh, welfare of the family, but will also lead to the social welfare improvements. Microfinance as mentioned by President Clinton, is an effective tool for partnering out of poverty. Microfinance today is a global movement. There are 2,500 microfinance institutions that service 64 million clients, the majority of whom are women. Poor people are credible 
And unlike the rich, they will always pay their loans back. Okay. Some of you may have heard of Amartya Sen, the Nobel laureate. He stated that the availability and access to finance has a crucial significance on in economic entitlements in a society. This implies that we have to build equitable and accessible financial systems. It is very important for us to treat access to credit as a fundamental human right. <laughs> Professor Mohammed Yunus of the Grameen Bank has often stated that poverty is caused by anti-poor institutions. It is my belief that today's financial innovation is investing in sustainable microfinance institutions that can, that can expand outreach to the poor. I believe reducing poverty is an achievable goal. I read the Gallup survey that was done for the World Economic Forum with great interest. It stated that most people feel disempowered about influencing political, economic, and social issues that affect their daily lives. Most people feel that the economic prospects of their regions and their countries are uh, quite gloomy. This is exactly the way the poor feel in the world today. However, microfinance has shown a way out. Women who participate in microfinance have experienced changes in self-esteem. They're viewed by their families and by society as whole as catalysts and economic agents of change. Research has shown that 32% of microfinance clients are able to move out of the poverty trap in just one year. In some cases, they are able to earn $27 more a month, which enables them to purchase better health care, better nutrition, and better education for their families. I am hopeful one day, very soon, we will be able to relegate poverty to a museum, and we will be able to shake hands with the last poor woman on this planet. I believe that with growing technology, increased financial innovations, and the awareness about the consequences of the inequity of wealth, we can create a prosperous and a just society. Let's stop the 1.7 million children that die in the world due to growing poverty today. I know we can do it. Thank you. Thank you, Roshani. Jim, you're off, uh, just off a plane from Moscow. Thank you for being us, with us here in the opening plenary. Um, Roshani has spoke to the uh, broader issues of development. And uh, I would like to believe that uh, development is one road then, uh, a bridge to greater security and prosperity. Yet we seem to be having this constant problem in the world of today of being able to deliver, to make good, on our promises. Uh, expectations of development by those that aspire to them grow exponentially, and in the best of cases, it seems we only resolve them arithmetically. Um, has the, have these conditions in the world of today made the bank in a way change its mission, look at things in a different way? Is the bank properly resourced? Um, as an institution made 50 years ago to meet the challenges that we're supposed to be meeting today? <clears throat> well, I think first I would uh, like to agree with the analysis of Rosanna in terms of the crucial need to deal with the question of social justice as one thinks in terms of partnership for security and prosperity. Prosperity without social justice is not going to lead to peace, and it's not going to lead to stability. And we have before us the daunting challenge of the, not only the 1.2 billion, but the close to 3 billion, half the world, that lives under $2 a day. And we have the further daunting challenge uh, that in the next 30 years, our world grows from 6 billion people to 8 billion and all but 50 million go to developing countries. I might add that there is one other sector of society, including uh, uh, relating to gender, which we also overlook, which is the question of youth. We have 2.8 billion young people in the world today under the age of 23. 
And when I speak to them and when I recently address them to talk about development and talked about their future, they said very pointedly to me, uh, Mr. President, we, we are not the future with a now. And they pointed out that their views and their involvement are crucial. And in fact, the focus that we face is how we can provide them with jobs and with hope. And we're not doing a great job. I was interested that when we started with the space station, what a Martian would think if he came to Earth and looked at what we've done since the Millennial Assembly. Uh, since the Millennial Assembly, uh, in the Millennial Assembly, every leader on Earth addressed the questions that we're addressing here. And they concluded that the challenge before us was the challenge of halving poverty, of dealing with the question of social justice, of dealing with women, of dealing with the environment. And they set up the framework for a partnership, a partnership uh, that was outlined in Monterey and in Johannesburg, in which the rich countries basically said uh, to the poor countries, you do your job and we'll do ours. And President Obasanjo has been one of the leaders in NEPAD, which has adopted this. And the poor countries have said, we understand we have to improve governance. We understand that we must fix legal and judicial systems. We must address the financial system, including the issue of credit to which you referred. And we must fight corruption if we are going to bring about the results. And this was clearly articulated in all these meetings. And a Martian would say, well, that's pretty clever. They understand this. And the rich countries would say, well, we're going to help you, and we're going to deal with the question of helping you build capacity. We're going to open our markets for trade, and we're going to provide increased development assistance. Well, the Doha round has not really given thus far great confidence in that movement forward. And today, in development assistance, we're at 0.22 per cent of GDP as compared with 0.5 per cent of global GDP 40 years ago. And although there have been some admirable movements forward in Europe and in the US about incremental increases, the Martian would say, but you're putting in $50 billion or so a year, but you're spending in 1999 $800 billion on defense, probably now a $1 trillion on defense. So when you talk about security, is it what uh, the president of Iran said? Is it, is it security that's forced by a gun? Or is it security that is forced by creating the human condition in which people want peace? And I think the Martian would go back and say they're pretty intelligent in terms of their analysis, but they're not doing a great job in terms of implementation. Mm -hmm. And the other interesting thing they'd say is, and you know, the papers are full of stuff on, on conflict, and they're full of stuff on how you raise money to deal with post-conflict situations. But I didn't read much about the fundamental questions of poverty and peace. And so in answer to your direct question, do I think that the mission has changed? I think the mission has been well articulated. It's changed from the establishment of the Bretton Woods institutions, which was for post-war reconstruction. But the focus of our institutions has been on poverty now for some years. But it is not just our institution that can make the difference. It is groups like this where you bring together the people that bring about national policies, business, civil society, to come together and say, let's give this the priority that is needed. This is not an issue that can be left alone to international institutions or to civil society or to business or to local governments. This can only be dealt with if we do it together and if we give distinctive priority to the issue. And let me finally say that it's not just money. As the President said earlier, we have to include in this a renewal of a sense of values, a new renewal of a sense of ethics, a renewal of a sense of belief in ourselves and in humanity, because without that, a check is not going to deal with it. 
And I very much hope that we can include also one of the other issues that is being discussed here, the question of faith and the question of values, because that too must find its place in a solution. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Carly, let's turn to business, please. Business uh, is a very important, very dynamic engine of global growth. And in that respect, it plays a very unique role in society. But in order for that engine to deliver all it can, it needs an enabling environment. On the one side, the physical and the political security. On the other side, a minimum of good macroeconomic balances uh, to move forward. Now, are you satisfied with the environment we have today? Do you hear things that our panelists have said that contribute to make a better environment? And if not, how could business contribute itself to creating that type of environment? Well, let me begin actually by going back all the way to the very first set of participants in this panel discussion, which were the two astronauts in the space station, because I think that little one minute illustrates some very important things that we're all talking about. It first demonstrates how much technology has changed our lives fundamentally. Here you have people literally from outer space engaging in a dialogue. And I think it illustrates the potential for increasing dialogue and connection, the possibilities that technology enables to increase dialogue and connection literally all over the world and out of this world. Uh, I am um, the chief executive as a, of a technology company, but I actually was not trained as a technologist. My university studies were in history and philosophy. And I find that looking back at history, even in a very fast-moving industry like technology, is frequently helpful. There were two social scientists who wrote about 50 years ago, John von Neumann and Oscar Morgenstern. And their fundamental theory was that if you looked back at the arc of human history, you could divide human history into two kinds of periods, what they called zero-sum games and what they called non-zero-sum games. Zero-sum games were situations in which for one party to win, another party had to lose. And there are many moments in history that have been zero-sum games. Non-zero-sum games are periods where everyone can win. And interestingly, the periods in history that were characterized by the most non-zero-sum games were when some new technology burst upon the scene or some new event, whether it was the invention of the wheel or the Silk Road or, as President Katami mentioned, the discovery of the new world or the invention of the airplane or the automobile, and today the invention of technologies such as the internet that allow all of us to communicate and dialogue in a much richer way. <clears throat> we can be in a non-zero-sum period in history, but it of course takes the subject of this uh, discussion, which is true partnering for security and prosperity. So um, partnering, certainly to truly partner then all of the kinds of institutions that are represented here at Davos and represented here on this stage must understand the contribution not only of themselves, but of the other. And there is no question that business has a hugely important role to play. It's also unquestionable that business, particularly big business, is viewed by many with suspicion, if not outright hostility, and that in many cases, perhaps, that suspicion has been in some people's minds justified by the greed and uh, lack of ethics that several scandals demonstrate. But it is clear that business must play a role, if only because, as you mentioned, we are so large, we have so much impact in the world. Just as but one example, Hewlett Packard is a company that participates in 176 nations around the world and has one billion customers. 
But business also has to recognize that its fundamental objective is to do more than make a profit. Our objective must also be to perform, to participate as a good global citizen. And being a good global citizen means more than doing no harm. Being a good global citizen means, at least the way we think about it at AHP, that business must do well and do good. Now, as the greeting from the space station illustrated, technology can create vast new opportunities for participation and connection and dialogue, but technology also can divide. And one of the things that companies know is that as technology changes our world, we have to change ourselves to keep up with that world. Companies know well that to keep up, we must constantly invest in our own competitiveness. And I think this is a lesson, actually, that countries can learn from companies. Just as business must learn from multilateral agencies and NGOs and social entrepreneurs and governments, just as business must learn that our objective must be broader than simply making money, that our objective also must be to do good. So I think countries can learn from businesses that competitiveness is a required investment, a required investment in order to be able to participate. And what security and prosperity require is as much participation by as many members of society as possible, whether those are women or children or impoverished people. And so participation in this new world requires investment in competitiveness. What constitutes investment in competitiveness? And competitiveness is a license to participate. I think it's sort of three things, and it's the same things for countries as it is for companies. It is first an investment in education, training. This is a knowledge society now. And for people to participate in this knowledge society, they must not only have access to credit, access to opportunity, they have to have the tools to take advantage of that opportunity. And that means education and training. And it is true the world over, including in the United States, that we are investing less in education and training today, not more. Second, companies now, and countries as well, must invest in honesty, transparency, accountability, meritocracy, honesty, which is always based in ethics and values, transparency, which means that our decisions must be open to uh, scrutiny, accountability in the sense that we do what we say we are going to do and deal with the consequences, and meritocracies in the sense that in the end it is about talent. And any company knows that the company with the best talent wins, and the package that that talent comes in is irrelevant. And countries as well, I think, know that. So competitiveness requires ed education, training, honesty, transparency, accountability, meritocracy. And competitiveness, which is the ability to participate in this new world, also requires the use of technology, the embrace of technology. Technology can be a tremendous equalizer, just as education can be a tremendous equalizer. We will not take advantage of the power that technology unlocks without real partnership. We will not build a more prosperous, secure world without a real partnership. But real partnerships require all of us in the equation, business, government, NGOs, everyone here. It requires all of us to make those investments necessary that allow us to participate. In business, we call it competitiveness. I think increasingly, as nations, we need to call it competitiveness as well. 
And I guess finally I would say, because this is, these are difficult topics, and as many of the preceding speakers have said, we can look at the statistics and become very discouraged. I think progress, continued progress, requires an equal measure of realism and optimism. We have to be realistic that this is very difficult. We have to be realistic that many suspicions and obstacles have to be overcome. We have to be realistic as well that sometimes it is two steps forward and three steps back before it can be two steps forward and one step back. But I think without optimism, there is no progress. Without optimism and a focus on the possibilities, nothing changes, nothing gets better. And so in answer to your very first question, is there more that can be done? Absolutely. But as HP works with governments and local communities and social entrepreneurs and institutions like the World Bank all over the world, I see great reason for optimism as well. Thank you, Carly. Thank you. Ellie, you are the humanist par excellence. Um, what is going through your thoughts right now after you've heard your colleagues on this panel? As I listened and I listened well, I realized there are so many things I don't know. Fiona, I don't even know how to use a computer. <laughs> and you talk about Mars. Jim, my friend, speaks about Martians. I wonder what a Martian would say when he comes here. He would simply say, please, stay home. <laughs> but you need to come there. We don't need you. You don't need us. Stay home. Do something with your own life. But then I, I studied the three words, and I wondered, what do they have in common? Except that they all reflect the spirit of Davos, of which our friend Dr. Schwab so eloquently spoke. Uh, the spirit of Davos means what? You bring people who have power, economic power, political power, social power, and occasionally military power. You bring them together. Why? So they should learn from each other what to do with power. Power alone can remain sterile and destructive. It all depends what you do with it. But then what do you do with it then? And then if I, I heard... I heard uh, my colleagues here speak, and I remember the story. In my little hometown, in the Carpathian Mountains, a father and a son were daily having arguments. The father wanted the son to get up early in the morning, very early, to go to the house of prayer and study and study. And of course the son was lazy. One day, the father managed to convince his son to get up very early, so they go together to the house of study and prayer. And all of a sudden, the son saw on the sidewalk a silver coin. He picks it up. And the father says, you see, my son, if you get up early, you find a silver coin. And the son said, but dad, the guy who lost it got up even earlier. <laughs> <laughs> this is not the last in economy, but not even in morality. But it is a question. Does one have to lose for the other to find? And this really is the question that everybody is asking, has already asked here. What do you do with wealth? What do you do with money? What do you do with what you have? Now, what we all find naturally, each in his own field, I as a teacher or a writer, and all of you who are leaders in your own fields, I am defined not by myself, but by the other. I am not free because others are not. I am free because others are. And if others are not free, I am not free either. I am not happy because others are unhappy. I can only be happy if others are happy. And if they are not, I cannot be happy either. For what do we do in life? We see the other and we wonder, is the other my ally 
or is the other my enemy? Is he my partner or is he my victim? I cannot live alone. God alone is alone. And even God, in his loneliness, does need us. That is what we learn from our mystical teachers, not only in Koran and the Christianity, Mr. President, both of the Koran and the New Testament have some ancestors, let's say the Jewish religion after all. <laughs> I know, maybe you, don't, maybe you don't have enough Jews in, in Nigeria, but we can send you a few. And, you know. <laughs> what is the lesson for us, really? The lesson is that I can only hope to fulfill myself and find not only optimism, but hope. After all, that is the goal of Davos too, to give hope to children not only the children now, but the children tomorrow, through the other, alone, believe me, having lived what I have lived through, I have all the reasons in the world, I have all the rights in the world to give up and to say, I choose despair as a protest. Alone, I can do that. But if I think of the other, any other, I have no right to do that. If I think of the child in my classroom, I have no right to teach him or her despair. If I write a book, I have no right to give the reader of my book an added measure of despair. So yes, partnership naturally is important. And of course, prosperity should come not from war, because we know that war also brings prosperity. Prosperity must come from a sense of justice and beauty. It is beautiful to see a poor person find reasons to feed his or her family. For a poor person or a hungry person doesn't want to hear me speak about abstractions. Somebody who is hungry needs one thing, bread, a piece of bread, and not a theory of bread, not even a theory of economy or of social justice. He wants bread. And when I hear here that so many people here are hungry, that hundreds of millions, my God, that hurts me. In the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel the prophet has an extraordinary expression which I don't find in any other book called the shame of hunger. And I always wondered why should a hungry person, isn't it enough that he or she is hungry? Does he or she have to feel shame? And then I understood. The prophet Ezekiel did not speak of the hungry person's shame, but of mine. If a person is shame, if a person is hungry, I have to feel shame. And again, I define myself, therefore, by that person's, by that child's ability to live his or her life without hunger, and therefore be without shame. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Thank you. Jim, we have a few minutes left, and we have heard many different important opinions here on these themes. You have the broadest operational overview of how the world is advancing on these different elements. Would you please share a couple of closing remarks with us? <clears throat> well, thank you very much, and I think uh, this panel has done a superb job in articulating both at a practical and um, a philosophical level uh, the importance of partnership. And I think we have brought out for you that security and prosperity will only exist together if we are not ashamed about hunger and if there is a greater sense of equity and justice. And it's in that context that I would give my overview about where we stand. Broadly, I think developing countries are recognizing that they have a responsibility for improved management, for attacking the issues of corruption, for attacking the issues of building systems of justice and finance, and 
considerable progress has been made, including, may I say, by President Obasanjo. But when we come to the response of the world in general, I think we have the balance wrong. I think when we have a world in which one billion people control 80% of the assets of the world and the income of the world, and we have five billion people who control less than 20%, and as I said, that five billion will grow by two billion in the next 30 years. When we have that situation, we as human beings and as leaders are not addressing the question of how we correct this imbalance. We are not correcting it at the national level because we do not recognize the fact of interdependence or the facts that Ellie was talking about. Put another way, poverty somewhere affects people everywhere. We cannot have poverty in South Asia or in Africa and in the rich countries feel that we have no shame or no responsibility. But more than that, it's not just shame and responsibility, it is self-interest. In the world that we're in today, we cannot defer to wars and to crises the issue of poverty and addressing it in a priority way. And I believe that we are not doing that adequately. I think there has been and have been a number of steps forward since the Millennial Assembly. But you cannot say that when you're spending 800 to a trillion dollars on military expenditure and when agricultural protection, either as subsidies or tariffs, exceeds 300 billion, that 50 billion dollars is enough as a financial transfer that openness of markets limitations should not be reopened. And frankly, uh, in response to your question, I think we can be glad about some initiatives that be taken, but we need to give far greater priority to the question of poverty if we are going to ever have security based on prosperity. You cannot have a prosperity for a few in a world where we have 2.8 billion young people coming along looking for hope. You cannot have peace without hope. You cannot have peace without addressing the question of poverty. And I just hope that in the partnership that is forged here with private sector, civil society and government, we can put front burner on our consideration this question, and I'm delighted that Dr. Schwab and his colleagues have put it here. Because, as the Martian said, it's not just Iraq and it's not just Afghanistan. It is an underlying issue of humanity that will allow us to form a partnership that brings us prosperity and security, but only with social justice and only with hope for everybody. Thank you, Jim. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming and thanking our panel.